so <clears throat> I was just reflecting during the morning, we were listening to Sheila asking us to think back about what we had learned during the pandemic and the learnings that we might want to bring with us. And I do have to confess that my very first thought was elasticated waistbands. <laughs> I am never, I am never going back. I am Jenny Ryan and I'm here to talk to you about the use of e-portfolios in a couple of modules in our physics and instrumentation honours degree. I would love to tell you that we trial the portfolios because we have a continuous commitment to reviewing and implementing the very best of modern pedagogy. Actually, what happened is we were forced into it. COVID hit, lockdown March 2020, June and August 2020, exams moved online with remote proctoring, and these were exams that had not been written for that form of proctoring. There's a real problem in physics type summative final exams for remote proctoring. We tend to use a lot of formal proofs and that's something that could easily be copied. And we also tend to use a lot of numerical problems with fixed particular answers. So something students can share. So we were very concerned about protecting exam integrity and our colleagues in the creative arts had told us that e-portfolios were a good way to go. You can see students developing material over the year, so you know it's their work, and you can get students working on individualized data sets. So even if you're getting them to apply the same process, the same techniques, if they're applying it to a totally different data set, then you get totally different results, totally different analyses, and totally different conclusions. So there was a call from what was the GMIT Teaching and Learning Office, fantastically represented by Karina and Jessica here today, uh, in January 2021 for projects for the Student Success Fund, and Mossy and I applied and got some funding to work on e-portfolios in physics. Now by this stage of the morning, everybody knows what an e-portfolio is. There's just three points I'd like to bring out that I found useful when thinking about e-portfolios. First of all, it's a social constructivist pedagogy. The idea is that students learn better if they make knowledge themselves than if we give it to them passively. Secondly, as Cormac illustrated really, really well, it makes the invisible learning visible. You're documenting the progress of a student, you're documenting their wrong turns, their learning journey, and you don't see that in a final summative exam. And then the final thing is that the literature tends to show that e-portfolios are used for one of three main purposes. One is the process portfolio, where again, you're documenting that learning journey. The second one is the showcase portfolio, where you're demonstrating the pinnacle of your work, your best achievements. And then the type that we were largely using here, an assessment portfolio, where you're using the portfolio to demonstrate that students have met the learning outcomes for a model, for a module. So before I started this work, this was basically my idea of what a portfolio was, a large cardboard envelope. There's loads of use of portfolio, huge pedigree in history, in art, architecture, in MBAs, in languages, loads and loads in the healthcare side, healthcare assistants, psychology, nursing, they have all used e-portfolios for ages. But when you look in the literature, there's much less information on the use of portfolios and e-portfolios in physics. Whitworth here and Slater um, took high school students and introductory undergraduate um, physics module students and they got them to go out into the real world and take photographs of real world um, examples of the theoretical concepts that they were studying in class. There's a lovely study by Sharon Kavanagh in 2017 in what was then the IT Carlo, where she had students who were taking one physics module on light and sound as part of a TV and media degree, uh, sorry, a um, TV and media program. And she asked them to go out and photograph examples of the phenomena associated with the light about which she was teaching them. So this is interference patterns there that you can see. But there's much less information about the use of portfolios and e-portfolios in the subsequent years of sort of hard science or physics type courses. So we had three desired outcomes from this project. One was just to check and see, can we use e-portfolios to replace traditional summative exams in these math intensive physics type uh, programs? Secondly, we wanted to work how much guidance we needed to give students, both in terms of written brief and in terms of teacher-student interaction. And then the third thing we hoped to do was to construct a marking rubric co-designed with the student to give the student a sense of agency and ownership over the marking of their e-portfolio. 
So what we did was we applied the ePortfolio methodology simultaneously to two different modules. There was Mossy's module, a second year module, which was control and instrument systems. And there was my module, a fourth year module, and digital system processing, sorry, digital signal processing. So two modules at the same time. So for Mossy's module, the ePortfolio counted for 10% of the overall module marks. It was compulsory and it replaced a number of CA problem sheets. For my module, it was 30% of the overall marks. I felt that it wouldn't be fair to make it compulsory. For fourth year students, their final marks are so important to them and I couldn't really force them to use a teaching methodology that I really didn't have much experience in myself. So I made it optional. Their choices were to do either the portfolio or to do a formal sit down three hour practical exam. For the exam or the e-portfolio, in both cases, students had to design filters, evaluate those filters. They could use any resources they wanted to, but it had to be individual, not group work. The exam was time limited three hours. For the portfolio, they could work on the, the portfolio throughout the term. In the exam, the filters that they had to design were very, very tightly constrained. They were multi-band filters. I specified the frequency threshold cutoffs for both pass bands and stop bands. I specified how much ripple was allowed in pass and stop bands. I specified the slope of the frequency um, roll-off. But for the e-portfolio, what the students had to do was something different. They had to look at their data set and decide for their particular data set what would be an appropriate filter to apply to that particular data set. So each student had a different data set, each student was designing a different filter. The filters in the written exam were really quite complicated because I'd done the work of designing them. For the e-portfolio, I didn't mind if the students gave me a very simple single band low pass filter, that's fine, because they'd had to do the additional work of working out whether or not that filter was appropriate. In the end, one student who tends to do extraordinarily well at traditional summative written exams picked to do the practical exam and all the other students chose to do the portfolio. So for my module, there were six, well, there's five here, there were six initial briefs. I only actually managed to get through four of them in the term. The first one, I wanted students to pick a signal that was meaningful to them. In the second one, I wanted them to read the signal into a piece of software and explain what it looked like in both the time and the frequency domain. Then in the fourth and fifth, I wanted them to pick a filter, for one, a notch filter, for the second one, a band pass filter. Argue why it will be appropriate to apply that particular filter to their particular data set, and then design the filter, apply it, evaluate how well it went and come back to me with improvements, how they would improve that filter if they were designing it again. So they could have picked any uh, one dimensional signal they wanted to at all. I thought they might go for current or, or voltage signals from the third year project. They all exclusively chose to go for audio files. Some of them went for stereo, some of them went for mono. A lot of them went for these very simple repetitive things so like a drum roll or an alarm clock, signals with a very clear frequency. A lot of music, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody surfaced a good few times and the Stones, surprisingly popular. I wouldn't have thought that my students know who the Stones are, but anyway. This was my absolute favourite, if it will play. Oh, it won't play for me. I'll just see if I can go back. So this one student picked this. Oh, sorry, my hands are too shaky there. That audio is not coming through, is it? So that is an audio file, a signal that is utterly meaningless to me, but was of deep significance to the student that picked it, made me laugh. So what kind of information did we give them? Well, for that second assignment brief, all I really gave them was this information here. Read your signal into MATLAB, tell me what it looks like in the time domain, tell me what you're seeing in the frequency domain. I can come back and talk about this um, initial marking rubric if anybody is interested in it later. But very, very basic information given. In terms of technologies, we offered the students the choice of Pebble Pad or Padlet, but they had already used Padlet and they were comfortable with it, so they all chose to use that. So what did they submit? Well, this is just a snapshot of one of the submissions from one of the students on Padlet. I've picked this one to show you because I particularly like it. 
So we'd asked the student to explain what aliasing was in their own words. Here what you've got is an audio file. What the student is doing is demonstrating how an audio signal's apparent frequency changes as the sampling frequency goes down, so an audio example. She also included a video, a visual example. In this video, it looks like the rotors of the helicopter are staying still. They aren't at all. It's because you've got an insufficient sample frequency. The frame rate on the video capture software is insufficient. But this student also here, you won't be able to see it, but in her MATLAB code, she went in and she designed a sine wave with a particular frequency, and then she subsequently sampled that sine wave at decreasing sampling frequencies and showed that as you went below the Nyquist limit, you got distortion in the signal. So this student has explained aliasing to me by video, by audio, and by coding. And so by the end of that, I'm very convinced, I'm very confident that the student understands the concept of aliasing and knows what it means in multiple domains. Other things they submitted, this is a time domain analysis, a frequency domain analysis. This is the same frequency domain analysis with a two kilohertz notch filter. This is the same frequency uh, domain analysis with, with a bandpass filter put on. We had bits of code, we had handwritten solutions to two pole notch filter designs, we had spectrograms. So students are submitting loads of different types of evidence that they have met the learning outcomes for the module. For Massey's module, the second year module, rather than picking a signal that they wanted to work on, they had to pick an instrument that they were interested in. So this student has picked a microphone to work with. Another student picked a thing called Hawkeye, which I had previously thought was a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But it turns out that it's a video refereeing piece of software used in GA. Who knew? Every day is a school day. So the students had to pick an instrument that meant something to them, and then they had to discuss the characteristics of that instrument. Well, how was it linear? What was its sensitivity? What was its accuracy? What was its precision? What did its dynamic response look like? So they investigated these concepts that we wanted to work with them, we wanted them to work with, but they investigated it for an instrument that was meaningful for them. So how did it go? Well, I have to say, our class numbers this year were very tiny, um, largely due to things related to COVID. We got a narrow result, range of results with the ePortfolio, so 35 to 68 was the range that I was getting. If I compile 10 years of previous terminal exams, I'm getting 25s to 85s. So in the terminal exam, students tend to, do, it's a bimodal distribution. Students tend to really do amazingly and knock it out of the park, or they find my questions completely confusing and really struggle. So a narrow range of results, although as I say, Class number is tiny, so probably statistically that's meaningless. The students appeared to be very engaged with the signals and the instruments they picked. The students started initiating and leading discussions. One of the things that Mossy really noted was that rather than students coming up to him and saying, how do I solve problem four on question sheet three? Students would come up to him and say, how do I demonstrate that this instrument has a linear response? So the, the inquiry of the student, that the focus of the student is being moved towards the learning outcome of the module. One of the things that my students found really frustrating is that when they designed real filters and applied them to real data sets, they had expected to change frequencies in one band, but there were inevitably changes outside that band in other areas of the frequency. For real world filters, there are trade-offs. And for real world instruments, there are trade-offs between cost, time, accuracy, linearity. So we ended up having discussions about the real world trade-offs, which we wouldn't have had were we working with the somewhat sanitized data sets and problems that I would usually build for the students to learn on. How did we mark it? Well, back to that second assessment uh, brief, uh, assignment brief. This on the left-hand side is the information that I gave to the students. I want you to input a signal, I want you to do a time domain analysis, and I want you to give me a frequency domain analysis. When I went to mark their work, these were the kinds of things that I was looking for. Have you told me what's on the x-axis? What the units are? What the range is? What the normalization is? What the signal to noise ratio looks like? So this information on the left is what I gave them. This information on the right is what I was actually looking for. What did we learn? Well, the first thing we learned is do not be overly prescriptive in designing your briefs. In the very first brief, both Mossy and I asked the students for five bits of information to show that they had met their learning outcomes. Immediately we got, why five? Why not three? Why not ten? What happens if one piece of evidence meets two learning outcomes? So we backed off very quickly and we removed those kinds of um, uh, prescriptive um, outputs. 
The other thing is I had initially planned to do six topics in mine. I was going to move from a one-dimensional signal to a two-dimensional image. I didn't get anywhere near that. I had to scale back on the topics that I wanted to discuss because it took students longer to work out what we were asking for, what kinds of evidence might show that they had met the learning outcomes, and they needed to think about the results that they were getting. In terms of guidance, you saw on the briefs we kept it to an absolute minimum to allow for student autonomy and flexibility. For the fourth years, that was absolutely fine. Second years, it didn't work. So for the fourth years, sorry, I was giving them this kind of information in this left-hand column. For the second years, we had to go back and break it down for them. We had to go back and say, OK, in order to show that you have met the learning outcomes, these are the kind of elements you need to discuss. They needed a lot more guidance. In terms of the face-to-face -face interaction, for the fourth years, Socratic questioning was all they needed. Why are you putting that thing in? What are you hoping to show? Do you think it shows that? That was fine. That was all the guidance they needed. Second years needed an awful lot more of explicit help. They needed to be told, no, that's wrong. No, that won't work. Have you thought about including this? They also needed a lot more help on the technical and things, how to find Padlet, how to upload a video, these kinds of things. One thing that was very obvious, and I suppose it should have been obvious to us, um, given that we were using a social constructivist pedagogy, is that the students who came into class and did their work in-house, as opposed to at home, online, and the students who talked to us and talked to each other did better. They got more guidance, they got more discussion, and they just did better. In terms of the product, it worked fantastically well. Very similar to examining a, studio, a student via Viva, if you ask a student to explain a concept to you in their own words, not in words that we've given them, it is immediately apparent. It is readily apparent whether they understand it or not. And it's really easy to see where misconceptions have arisen. In terms of the marking, this is not going to come as a shock to anybody. Every submission is unique. It takes far longer to mark, much, much longer to mark, and much longer to calibrate to make sure that you are marking fairly. It is, however, much more interesting to mark and much more fun. And because you're not just getting a final answer, you have some way of working out where misconceptions are creeping in. The one thing that absolutely completely failed for this in the study to do with the marking is we had initially hoped to get the students to co-design the assessment rubric with us and to give them this sense of autonomy and control. Totally failed. They had no interest at all. They had no time. They were no stressed. They were very stressed. They saw that as our job and they didn't want to be doing our jobs. So we tried various methods to get them engaged and they were like, yeah, not my responsibility. What they wanted to know from us is how they could do the work to maximize their results, but they had zero interest in working with us on designing the rubric. In terms of timing, we just gave the, the students information um, at the start and they managed their own timelines. The second years got very confused between, well, got, got overwhelmed by other competing demands. So Massey redesigned um, in the middle. He basically taught them for 11 weeks and then he spent the last two weeks with no other requirements from the students just to work on that portfolio. And that focus time worked better. In terms of the student experience, the fourth year students we thought would resist this because it was final year. Actually, they adapted without problem. They probably have more self-confidence. There was a lot of fun, noise and chatter in the classroom, but there was also a lot more frustration. Real data sets are messier. The one thing, though, that we really noticed is that there were some students who would tend to perform in an average or a low average way in traditional summative assessments, and a couple of these students absolutely shone with the ePortfolio. They gave us work beyond anything we could have expected, demonstrating deep levels of understanding. So our results, we wanted to evaluate ePortfolios as a potential alternative to traditional summative exams in physics. Yeah, absolutely, it works fine. Perfectly reasonable vehicle for assessing students' ability to work, to formulate, to calculate, to troubleshoot, um, to evaluate mathematically based problems. Works fine. It wouldn't have worked if we had given them all a set of identical problem sheets and asked them to, to work them through. The two key elements were that the projects had to be individualised and the projects needed a creative aspect. But once you put that in, works fine. Also, I saw students developing a portfolio over time. I can guarantee it's their work. In terms of guidance, fourth years needed very little, second years needed it broken down for them much more, fourth years needed very little um, uh, help in the ongoing process, second years needed a lot more, and yeah, as I said, the final product, which was this construction of this co-designed Mark and Rubeck, disaster. Got nowhere with that at all. 
So in my conclusions, this is a very introductory study in the use of process and assessment portfolios in physics and instrumentation. Yep, the e-portfolios seem to work very well for physics maths-based modules as long as you have individualised and creative aspects. Some students prefer to go the traditional route, so it's probably best to use this as an additional assessment method rather than a replacement one. And as I say, we did see a couple of students who just shone in e-portfolios. From a UDL perspective, I think it is only fair that we continue to offer students the flexibility of this mode of demonstrating that they've met the learning outcomes. There's a load of future work. This was very introductory. I have loads more to do next September. But one thing we did note is that the students who talked more to us and each other did better. And I realised that I had never actually explicitly said to the students, I am expecting you to discuss this. I'm expecting you to talk about this. I never said that to them. I, I just sort of assumed that they would know it. So I need to go back and I need to make those expectations explicit. And the other thing is we would tend to have a lot of students with various different types of neurodiversity on our physics courses. I need to think of ways of incorporating this discussion for students who are not going to spontaneously start discussions who will not find that comfortable. So thank you very much.